Well, can I just give everyone a very warm welcome uh, to our prayer meeting this evening. Good to see you gathered in. Hopefully there'll be more to gather in uh, yet, even. Uh, we're going to make a start this evening uh, by turning to the hymn number 515, 515. Is your life a channel of blessing? Is the love of God flowing through you? Are you telling the lost of the Saviour? Are you ready his service to do? And we'll stand together as we sing this hymn. our meeting to him in prayer just now. Our Heavenly Father, we do rejoice in the fact that again we're spared to be in the house of God on a Tuesday evening. We thank thee, Lord, for the privilege that is ours uh, to meet freely, uh, none daring to make us afraid, uh, and to come and to meet together and to worship thee and seek thy face. And so, Lord, we commit our meeting to thee, We ask that thy presence would be known in our midst. We pray, Lord, for thy servant who has come into our midst. We ask, Lord, that our brother Colin will know help from thyself. 
uh, as he opens up the word to us and tells us of the work and the witness that he's involved in, him and his wife. And Lord, we uh, just ask that thou wilt continue to keep your good hand upon them. We do thank thee, Lord, for the good seed of the gospel that has been sown over so many years. And we pray, Lord, that thou wilt be pleased even to prosper uh, what has gone forth already. And we thank thee for the promise in your word that we, uh, uh, Lord, that in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And Lord, we ask that thou wilt come uh, and bless and give the increase, uh, even in what has gone before. Uh, bless us this evening. Uh, Lord, bring a challenge to our own hearts, we ask of thee. Uh, hel help us, Lord, to uh, be much in prayer for uh, the work of God in these days, not just within our own four walls, but, Lord, for those that have gone forth at thy command uh, to seek to bring the gospel uh, in uh, submission to thy word that we should go into all the world and preach the gospel. Bless our missionary band, we pray of thee. Uh, Lord, thou dost know the individual needs that there are in different corners of the vineyard. And Lord, we thank thee that thou art well able uh, to meet the need. And we just commit that to thee. Uh, bless us and do us good in our own souls this evening, we pray of thee. Encourage our hearts, we pray. And do, Lord, remember us and meet with us. For we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is good to be able to welcome our brother uh, Colin Maxwell back amongst us here. Not too sure how long it's been since you were here, Colin, a while. Uh, before COVID, anyway, I think. <laughs> well, it is good to have our brother back with us. We welcome him warmly again to Cumber here. And he's going to just come and he's make his report to us and tell us about the work uh, that he's involved in. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Clock's eight minutes fast, and I'm trying to work out whether well, that's in my favour or not. not mustn't be. And then there's a text at the back that says time is short, so uh, <laughs> I'm getting confused here with time. But it's great to be back with you here again in Comber. It has been a little while, although I was in the church uh, for some recordings just a while back there uh, during COVID, and uh, you can remember the green screen and so on, we were told... Uh, we got word that says, don't wear anything green. And I sent back word and said, well, there goes my Northern Ireland football shirt, as if I was going to wear that. But uh, no, it's great to be here and appreciate the warm words of welcome. Now, uh, there's two things that I want to do tonight. First of all, I'm going to bring a little word from the Lord. And I think that's always important, and no matter where we're in Christians meet together, prayer meetings and so on, that we have the word of the Lord. And then after that, I'll bring an update on the work of God and uh, keep you all informed for intelligent prayers. Can we turn, please, to John's Gospel, chapter 17? John's Gospel in the chapter 17. And uh, it's a long chapter, so we're just going to read it, though we'll be making reference to it, through, to it, to it all in the course of the message. But... We're going to read from the verse 18 down to the verse 20. John chapter 17, and commencing our reading at the verse 18. The words of the Saviour, and he is addressing them to his heavenly Father, his God and our God, his Father and our Father. Notice what he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word. We read the verse 21, that they all, they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. 
And we'll end our reading at the verse 21 there. And we look to the Lord to bless his word. Let's seek his face again just for a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, the hour has come for the preaching of the word of God. And the need of the hour, Lord, even now is that the preacher may know that gracious and powerful and filling of the Spirit of God. Lord, we cannot rely on the flesh, for the arm of flesh will surely fail on me, and we dare not trust our own. But we thank you for all the promises of God, and especially the promise that speaks about the outpouring of the Spirit of God. You shall receive power. After this, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Give us all an ear to hear what you're saying to us tonight. May we all find it in our hearts to say, I am listening, Lord, to thee. What hast thou to say to me? Hear and answer prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's words of verse 20 that we want to think about uh, this evening. Verse 20. Our Saviour said, Neither pray I for these alone. That's a reference to the apostles who were with him in the upper room. Neither do I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The context, of course, as you will have picked up, is uh, this is the great high priestly prayer which the Lord Jesus offered on to his followers the night in which he was betrayed and just before he went to the cross to suffer for our sins. Verses 1 to 5, we notice there that he prayed, first of all, for himself. He prayed for himself. Then verses 6 to 19, he prayed for the apostles. And then in verses 20, uh, right through to the end, he prayed for, for those who would believe through the apostles' words. And in order for the text then tonight to be relevant for us, we need to establish, first of all, that we have a direct link to the apostles, that we are apostolic people. And of course we do, because we worship the same Lord, the same Saviour. We read the apostles' writings, and we say, Well, their God is my God. The Lord Jesus, whom they preached, is the one in whom I believe. We preach the same doctrine. The apostles, you remember, left word. The apostle Paul left word that his doctrine would be passed on to each generation. He wrote to young Timothy, he says, uh, to uh, pass on the word of God. The same doctrine, pass thou on. Uh, make sure it's heard, believed, taught by faithful men. And we copy Paul's own policy of preaching nothing outside what Moses and the prophets wrote, thus uniting, therefore, the New Testament and the Old Testament together. And by doing that, we preach, or at least we try to preach, we ought to preach the whole counsel of God. We, we say we are apostolic people. And then, of course, for this text to be relevant to us, we must establish then the worth of the prayers of the Lord Jesus because he's praying for those who would believe through the apostles' word. And of course, here we are on the most solid of ground because the Son of God and the Father who sent him are one, not only in substance, as our catechism reminds us, equal in power and glory, but one also in purpose. And we remember the words of the Saviour when he stood at the tomb of Lazarus and he prayed first of all before he summons Lazarus out of the grave, he offered up prayer and he says, I know that thou hearest me always. In other words he's saying, I know that when I pray, not only that my prayers are heard as it were in, in the eardrums of God, but they enter into God's heart and I am heard, my prayers are answered. And every petition that the Saviour offered up was answered and will be answered 100% of the time. And these two great truths come in together. Our link with the apostles, the worth, the infinite worth of the prayers of Christ, therefore guarantee 
This is where we're heading tonight. They guarantee the success of the work of God when we uh, preach the great apostolic truths to the lost. I say to you tonight, never grow weary in the work of God. Never get discouraged. Or if you do, never get deterred. Because our great high priest is now in heaven. And he's praying specifically, as he did that night so long ago. He's praying specifically for your work for God. Not, not only, not only in, a, in, in a general way, or not just in a general way, what the Lord Jesus prayed for the apostles, as we see here, he prays also for those who will believe in the future. That's our generation. That's every generation since the apostles, our generation, and every generation that is to come, our Savior in the glory at God's right hand, exalted high, is praying for the work of God to go forth in a most specific way. I want you to notice here, first of all, and this guarantees the success of the work of God. Notice here, number one, Jesus prays specifically for the conversion of his sheep. He prays specifically for the conversion of his sheep. Back in John chapter 10 and verse 16, when he spoke about the good shepherd giving his life for the sheep and so on, <coughs> you remember how he spoke particularly. He said there, there are other sheep I have who are not of this fold. He's speaking about people who were unsaved, his own sheep, who, because they were not in the fold, they were not in Christ and not saving sense yet, in the words of the hymn writer, they were out in the mountains. They were wild and bare. And he says, of those sheep, them also I must bring. That always excites me when I read that. That, that steals me up when I pray for the work of God. I, I, I often plead this in prayer before God. Jesus said, our sheep I have, and they're not of this fold. Them also I must. There's an imperative in there. If you're in the habit of underlining your Bible, I suggest you underline the word must. Them I must bring, because if they must be brought, then brought they shall be. And they will be brought, we believe, through the preaching of the apostles' word. Do you remember what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth? He says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. And I think in there, you know, we can, uh, when we think of preaching, we think of pulpits, don't we? We think of men standing like I'm standing tonight. But I, I see then there the preaching a little wider than the pulpit work. I see evangelism in there. I see children's meetings in there, five-day clubs. I, I see people doing door-to-door -door outreach. I see track distributors in there. I see people who are evangelizing, and it pleases God. By the foolishness of preaching, to see of those that will believe. They're brought through the preaching of the word of God, but they are also brought through the prayers of Christ for their conversion. Because when the high priest in the Old Testament, who pictures the high priest, our great high priest, the Savior, when he went into the uh, holiest of all, he wore a breastplate, and there were names on his breastplate. And you can be sure that the Lord Jesus prayed for your conversion. You think back to your own saved days when you perhaps had little thought towards him. Now what it says about the wicked, God is not, and all their thoughts, or maybe you had wicked thoughts towards him. You give manifestation to that description of the ungodly as being a hater of God. The Lord Jesus Oh, the grace of it all. He was praying for you. He was praying into being those circumstances that brought you to Christ. He was praying into being maybe that gospel mission. That despite yourself, you found yourself in attendance. He was praying into existence, that little track that came through your door. Or somebody pressed into your hand. Or that conversation that you had that brought you to the Savior. It was all there because of the prayers 
of God's people. You see, there's nothing hit and miss tonight about our evangelism. It might appear to be so to us. Even the parable that the Savior told about evangelism was a sower gone out. And the Bible says he sowed the seed. The word there literally is he broadcasted. He scattered the seed. He scattered it here, there, and yonder. He didn't pick out the good soil. He didn't say, well, here uh, the soil is good and go along seed by seed and put it in. If you are watching him, he's just scattering this great bag of seed. And the birds of the air were already sweeping down, even as he's in the fairy field, taking away some of that good seed. And the thorns were already there. The seed would fall among the thorns. The little root would go down. But there would be no growth, no harvest, because the thorns side by side were there waiting to choke the good seed. But I say to you tonight that not one seed, not one seed landed outside the ordained spot. And in due time, in God's own time, a goodly harvest was gathered in. You know, one of the great titles of God the Saviour gave to him is that he is the Lord of the harvest. And it's in the context of the Lord of the, of the harvest that we are to pray. We pray that he'll send forth more laborers into the vineyard. And the good seed produces conversions in God's good time because our Savior is praying that it will be so. We know that not in every evangelistic effort, be it missions come and go, efforts come and go, and so on, Nobody may be interested. That's all part of it. But all who have been given of the Father will be brought to him. We're great people, aren't we, for quoting John 6 and 37, the second part. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. But what about the first part? Yes, the second part encourages the sinner. What about the poor evangelist? All that the Father, here's his encouragement. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. And then him that cometh to me, I will in no ways cast out. Here's a great start and our claim of guaranteed success. Our Savior in the glory is praying, as he's praying here in John 17, for those who would believe through the Apostle's word. And then we notice that the Lord prays not only for the conversion of his sheep, but he prays, and we look here in verses 15 to 17, for the sanctifying of the sheep. The sanctifying of the sheep. We have it there in verses 15 right through to the verse 17. I pray not that thou wouldest take them out of the world, but that thou would keep them from, from evil. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Why are we brought to Christ? Why were we brought to the Savior? What was God's purpose in calling us out of a mass of destruction? Maybe you live in one of the estates. There's not many Christians around you. And, and you were drawn to Christ. Why were you drawn to Christ? Not only to save you from the wrath to come. And yes, that's there. And, and it needs to be there. And it is there. Not only to enjoy heaven when you die and go into the glory. No, you were saved that you might live holy in Christ Jesus here on earth. To be sanctified, negatively speaking, is to be kept separated from the world, not locked in a monastery, not away in some convent, but kept out of worldliness, walking apart from the world, kept from evil. And positively, sanctification is to walk with God in the light of his word. And again, the great instrument to this end is the same instrument that brought us to the Savior. It's the Word of God. Sanctify them, verse 17, through thy truth, thy word, the Bible is truth. And it is a mark of a newborn babe in Christ that he has a desire for the sincere milk of the Word. I don't want tonight to be unduly negative. I don't want to be critical. But you really do have to wonder to be faithful here. You really have to wonder when people profess faith and yet they show little and soon no interest in learning God's word. And even when you make all the legitimate allowances, you make way for slow learners and maybe different circumstances and so on, 
But if there is no growth in grace whatsoever, if there is no evidence of an ongoing work, then the understate of tonight, we would have to show great concern. You see, I think one of the problems is this. We have introduced a new word into evangelism, a word that the Savior never used. We have let the word decision replace the word disciple. And the Great Commission was not go forth and get decisions. The Great Commission, in its fullest declaration in Matthew chapter 28, is go and teach all nations, making disciples. Not employing every gimmick from uh, Times Square advertising agencies. They get worthless decisions. No, make disciples. So that we have followers, not merely professors, followers of the Lord Jesus. Oh, what a mess uh, things seem to be in. And yet our Lord is praying that in the midst of it all, his sheep, whom he has drawn to himself, his gathered sheep will live godly in Christ Jesus. He's praying for something else. Again, the guarantee of the work of God. He's praying for this. He's praying, verses 11 and 12 there, for the security of his sheep. He says, now I am no more in the world. He's about to depart, we know that. But these are in the world, this world that hates God. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was within the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Oh, what a great truth this is. Not one of us, even the most pious, holiest among us, the strongest Christian among us, not one of us could keep our salvation secure for one moment of time. We would be quickly outsmarted and outgunned by the devil. You see, remember Peter. Peter had high thoughts of himself. He thought he could handle everything that come down the line. Yes, he says, I am willing even to go to death rather than deny the Lord. And yet at the word of a, of a wee girl, a wee lass, the mighty Peter fell. Oh, how were the mighty fallen when the weapons of war were perished. But he didn't fall finally. He fell grievously, but he didn't fall finally because the Lord Jesus said, Peter, I have prayed for thee. We're back in praying ground here. I have prayed for thee, Peter, that thy faith fail not. And, and neither it did. Yes, it wavered big time. There's no doubt about that. But the same Peter, my own reading this morning in John 21, Peter was restored once again. Peter said, I go a-fishing. God says, no, you don't. You go a-preaching, Peter. You go a-preaching. He was restored once again. That was never said about Judas. Never could be said about Judas. Judas was lost. And Judas was lost because he was not a sheep in Christ's fold. He was a goat among the sheep. He was an apostate, a servant of the devil. He's called here the son of perdition. You know, one of the great truths of God's word, and it's a glorious truth, is the eternal security of the sheep of Christ. We are kept by the power of God through faith. On the salvation. Our lives are hid with Christ and God. We will never perish. John 10, verse 28, guaranteed. John 6, guaranteed on a number of occasions a glorious resurrection at the last day. He's praying for the security of his sheep. Fourthly, here, moving on, he's praying for the unity of his sheep. Verse 21. Now read there what it says. I pray for them <coughs> that will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. And this isn't that old ecumenical unity centered round a, a return to the Pope of Rome, the old world council of churches stuff that uh, was fought many, many years ago. I think verse 21 must be one of the most 
misused and abused verses and texts in the Bible, many have wrested it to their own destruction. And we say of them in the words of Jacob, O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly mine honour, be not united. But there is a unity, a unity of spirit. There's a, 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 a unity here among God's people, not a, a compromising univer, a, a, a uniformity. It's a unity that must be Bible-based. It must go around the great fundamental doctrines of the faith. Yes, history shows that in the church, sometimes there is in-house fighting among the people of God. We've all sat, have we not, with other Christians from other churches, and we've had our big ding-dong battle over church polity or baptism or uh, election and all those things. Yes, there's in-house fighting, but there's secondary issues. I'm not saying they're not important. Don't misquote me. But we have a unity with those people. We see eye to eye different in some things on the fundamental doctrines of the faith. The great saving truths. We are at one. Because we are charged with the keeping of the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And how good and pleasant it is, the Bible says, when brethren dwell together in unity. The Lord's praying to that end. We see here, moving on, fifthly here, the Lord Jesus is praying, verse 13, for the joy of his sheep. The joy of his sheep. Verse 13, and now I come to thee and I speak these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And every child of God should be marked out as one who possesses what the Bible calls joy unspeakable and full of glory. We have everything tonight, everything to be joyful about. Our sins have been forgiven. Isn't that a tremendous thought? Put your head in the pillow tonight. Think about your sins. Let them loom up in front of you. Remember things you said and did, maybe even in recent times. And you know you're full of regret, your conscience at you. Listen, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We're justified, declared righteous in the courtroom of God. We have an advocate with the Father. We are indwelt. If we're Christians by the Spirit of God, we have access 24-7 to the throne of grace and inheritance on the field and reserve for us in heaven. We should be a joyful people. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It was the theme of that epistle to the Philippians. Paul wrote these words. He says to the Christians, A Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice Oh, be a joyful Christian tonight. That doesn't mean to say you have to be light. That doesn't mean to say that you have to be frothy. But it does say to be joyful. And again, the man in the glory, the one at God's right hand, is praying for the success of the work in producing joyful Christians. Sixthly and lastly, sixthly and lastly, the Lord Jesus prays. Verses 22 and 24, that his sheep may be glorified. Look there what it says. And the glory which thou givest me, I have given them. That's what he's praying. That they may be one even as we are one. Father, I will, verse 24, that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And what is glory? Just eternal security taken to its highest degree. Not merely making it over the line, but as we read in Second Peter, having an abundant entrance ministered unto us into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And I cannot begin tonight even to describe the glory. I have at home a little outline I sketched down. I'll have to get into it someday. You know, we, we sing the glory song, don't we? We call it the glory song. Oh, that will be glory for me. All those hymns that we sing. 
about. I have to I have to get round to the preaching of it sometime. Get the meat onto the bones that I have. But who could begin to describe the glory of God? What must heaven be like? What language could do it justice? You remember the golden chain, as it's called in Romans chapter eight, verse twenty nine, whom he did for no, whom he pre loved, for that's what it means. He also did predestinate. Mark them out to be saved. We move from eternity into time. There comes the call. It's an effectual call. Because whom he calls, he justifies. So it's just more than that general gospel call. Called by his. Justified. And whom he justified. Declared righteous in his sight. Them he also glorified. And that's the success, the guarantee of the work of God. And it's all because of John 17. The Saviour pleading, praying then, praying now. Oh, what an encouragement. What encouragement this is for the work of God. Why should I ever grow weary? Why should I faint by the way? Has he not promised to give me strength for the toils of the day? And that strength comes from a praying Saviour. The work's guaranteed. The success is guaranteed. And it's for us to get involved. Put our hand to the plough. Be part of it. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he sends forth more labourers. And labour they will. And bring in the sheep for whom he died. Till at last they're all gathered safely home. In the glory. May the Lord bless these words, just a few simple words for us tonight to encourage us. Thank you for having me along tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to come, especially in deputation, because it gives an opportunity again to thank you for your ongoing support over many, many years, and I certainly uh, appreciate it. Uh, as you know, and a brother made reference to it tonight. Uh, two years ago in came the COVID and it certainly wreaked havoc with the work of God and some doors were closed that might yet open up again uh, in the will of God but it certainly put breaks on the work and indeed for a little while uh, I was furloughed by the mission board that was during the first of the big lockdowns but it also had the effect of opening our doors I, I believe when the do one door closes, you just hang around a little while, and in God's own time, he opens another door for you. Remember the parable, why do you stand idle all the day long? Well, you can say, Lord, what, what else can I do? The door's shut. You need to open another door for me. And that's what happened uh, in the, uh, with, with the COVID. I, I wasn't able to get over the border at that time. At one time, it would have been illegal. For me to have crossed the border, I would have got as far. Uh, I would have crossed at Auchnacloy from where I live, and I would have got about six miles up the road, and the police were there, the guards were there. And if I did not have a valid reason to be there, I could have been fined two hundred pounds or two hundred euro. Now I could have said, "Well, I'm here to preach the gospel. I'm an evangelist, of the Free Presbyterians," and seen how that went down in court. But you want to stay out of courts as best you can. Uh, but uh, it would have been illegal. But when we come into the autumn time, we got, uh, things did lift a little bit more. I was able to get back over the border down to Knock and so on. We came into the autumn time, I got a phone call from Noel, Noel Shields. And uh, Noel was in a similar boat to me. He had missions lined up and they were cancelled. Couldn't get into the orange halls, couldn't get into the, the, the churches. Everything was restricted by the COVID. So he suggested that uh, we applied to the board in order to work together. And what we would do, as long as the shops were open and we weren't in a kind of lockdown, then we could get out round many different towns and have open our meetings. And that's what we have done, and we have covered a lot of ground. Uh, we've been in Portadown, Lurgan, Banbridge, Dungannon, uh, Newtonard, Cumber here. We stood outside there, down there at the square, Mr. Glassby down there at the squares, heard the word, and uh, preached the word there. We've been to Bangor, been to Hollywood, uh, and other places, back to Felt, Cookstown, Oma, Enniskillen, Irvinstown, a lot of different places proclaiming the word of God. 
And then as we moved through the winter months, we came into uh, some driving missions. Things were relaxing a little bit, and we've had a number of drive-in missions together. We had a good one on Money Slain, initially for a week, and we extended it into the second week, and we were so saved in the Money Slain mission. And also, a couple of weeks later, in Hillsborough. We didn't hear about the Hillsborough one night, or maybe a month or two afterwards. Uh, we were able to get a mission going in Limavati way back last December, in the church. In Limavati Church, it's in the big church, number wise, by 20 there on the Sabbath morning. We were having 30 in each night, and, and the weather was dreadful. Uh, it was really big storms. You know, just the, the, the nightmare nights, dark, wet, windy. But every night we had about 30 people in, including unsaved. We went to Bestbrook, that's around Noel's hometown, his end of things, South Armagh, and then we had a good mission down in Newcastle. We get into the primary school in Newcastle. Mr. Horace saying, Horace, the Reverend Horace said, it's a miracle that you've got this school for the mission. So we two weeks there, knocked a lot of doors beforehand. We left Newcastle, went up to John Knox and the Shankill Road. Again, small numbers, someone saved in. And uh, we just finished there a mission in Garva. And again, Garve up in County London, Derry, not a big congregation, but on saved in every night, three and four people gathered in. Maybe only two dozen people in the meeting, but three or four on saved among them. And all these missions are preceded by door-to-door evangelism. So there's a lot of walking up and down garden paths. We just don't put them through the doors. That's fine if you want to cover a lot of ground fairly quickly, but we knock the doors. A lot of people's not in. And then I, I, I do believe that there's people in, but they won't come to the door. You're looking at them, and they're looking at you. You're knocking the door, and you, I'm looking at I'm visible here. You know, they're not, just not going to open the door. So you give the invite through the door in the little gospel tract, and you just pray that the people will come in. Now, my immediate plans here, I have part of company with Noel just this week. We finished Garva there on Sunday night, and I have part of company with him again over the summer months because uh, he's things to do. He's actually having a mission, starting a mission next week in Bambridge with the Reverend David Smith. So he's knocking doors this week in Bambridge. And then that mission, he's other things to do different places. I have different things to do and different places to go. And I'm planning, God willing, this time tomorrow night, I will be en route down to Knock Shrine again. This is one of my haunts that I like to go to in the summer months to speak with uh, the Roman Catholic people down there. I always get on well at Knock. I had a very good year last year at Knock and uh, looking forward to going down again. Uh, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, I suppose, uh, the mission board got me a little camper van, just a small one, ideal, brilliant for the work of God. But it has come to the end of its road. Uh, it's not in the glory <laughs> it's been scrapped but uh, they have replaced it with another vehicle and God willing will be able to uh, go down there this week just going down for two days just to start off and uh, put the little book display out and hopefully get talking to the different people down there also get back again down to Dublin and preach outside the GPO uh, with some men down there. Now there's others are going down. I, I notice uh, there's some folk going around at the moment doing some open airs and uh, getting in big trouble with the police. I don't think they're the wisest, to be honest, the way they're getting on. Uh, it's very worrying. And it seems they're spending a lot of time in Dublin at the moment. So I am very apprehensive about that. But nevertheless, you still have to go. There's never been a period in church history where there wasn't confusion among the people. You look at a lot of those epistles, the words of the apostles that we've got to preach. Many of them are written in dire circumstances. The Corinthian epistle, what, what a mess in the church. The Galatian epistle, legalists. The Colossians, dealing with the Gnostics. It's always been trouble. But the word of God still goes forth because that's the way that the Lord has ordained it. 
So after the summer's over, I think Noel's heading out in September to Uganda, and uh, therefore I'll not have Noel. I'll be away at that time anyway for three days to the Ploughing Championships. It's starting up again. We've missed it for two full years, but now we're able to get back again. So we're looking forward to that, and again there's missions been planned into the winter months. Uh, one in Bowen and Hinch, another London Derry, one near Dungannon. Uh, talk about one on the Isle of Man. So you can see that uh, there's certainly plenty, there's still plenty to be done. So I appreciate your prayers, as I've already said, your, your practical support. And I remind you that we've brought a number of prayer cards tonight. Now you might already have this prayer card because I just went for a reprint. I discovered when I looked at my old prayer cards, every prayer card I was losing more hair. So I said, right, uh, I'm just going, to, uh, just going to go for a reprint here of last one. If you want to draw hair on it, you go ahead. I don't mind. As long as I don't see it, you can draw what you want on it. If you're putting pen to it, there's a little bit on the side. That was neat. You didn't see how I did that, did you? There's a wee bit there on the side. And if you want to uh, support me on a monthly basis, feel the Lord's putting that in your heart. Well, then you fill that in and you send that off to the mission board office. You know how it works. But one way or the other, first and foremost, a prayer card. And if you don't have it, you take it and pray for us, please, regularly. Pray that God will bless his word as it sounded forth in, a, in all these different ways. In the south of Ireland over the summer months, in a little nearer home, pray that God will indeed bring in those other sheep that he has for whom the Saviour died. Thank you again for listening well. I certainly appreciate that. I'll hand it back to our brother, Jackie, again. I do want to thank our brother Colm uh, for coming along and for uh, bringing us that report and keeping us in the picture as to how things are going and what, he, what he's involved in. And of course, uh, I'm sure that uh, his main object is that we might remember him in prayer and keep him before the throne of grace. Uh, but we need to look after the practical aspect as well. And, of course, there will be an opportunity as you leave uh, to uh, contribute. This is a deputation meeting uh, so that we raise some funds to assist our brother and keep him uh, involved uh, in the work. So we do just remind you of that and ask you uh, to, be, uh, to give as the Lord has prospered you. We're going to uh, sing another hymn. Just become...